Clarence Ray Allen was born on the 16th of January 1930 in Blair, Oklahoma. He and his family were very poor and took work wherever they could. Allen took to picking cotton at a local farm. He was very interested in studying the native Indians and at a later age he associated himself with them stating that he was in fact a member of the Mosogian Indian tribe. He moved from Oklahoma and made his home in Fresno, California. Allen always wanted more for himself and started his own company in security. He was said to be incredibly hard working and a man that could sell ice to the Eskimos. His company went from strength to strength and in time he left his small rented accommodation and went on to own in his very own ranch with a large swimming pool. The ranch was where he enjoyed to showcase his many thoroughbred horses and he even owned his own aeroplane. This should have been more than enough for any man, but unfortunately it wasn't. Alan was bored of the wealth, so within his security firm, he began to get the attention of local petty criminals who sought to earn a quick buck. Alan liked the fact that he was able to be in charge of so many people, and with that in mind, he formed a gang and named it after himself. He hired the assistance of those local criminals and organised robberies with them, and the robberies of stores and markets were all executed to plan. He was hard on the people in the gang. He had rules which they had to all abide by, and many of these members had to prove themselves to him. But he wasn't shy in showing these people exactly what could happen if they ever told anyone, especially the authorities, about their antics. Two people had been killed in Nevada for apparently snitching to authorities. Alan showed them the newspaper story and told them that they were his kills. The gang got the message that if anyone were to tell, they would assume the same fate. Alan continued robbing many different places with some of the people he had working under his security firm. But he was gearing himself up for the big one. He had arranged to rob, along with three other criminals, the Franz Market. This was a marketplace which was popular in Fresno. It was owned by a couple who Alan knew well, but this didn't seem to matter to Alan. He wasn't loyal when money was involved. He managed to have one of the sons of the owners of the market come to his ranch for a swim. And while he was there in the pool, the keys to the market would be stolen from him. And Mary Sue Kitts, who was the girlfriend of one of the boys, would tell them the best time to hit the market. A time where there would be no witnesses and the time when the most cashed would be on site for his biggest reward. The robbery went well. $10,000 was heisted from it, a very lucrative rob. But Mary felt bad and decided to tell the owner's son who was responsible for the robbery. This information of deceit by Mary had got back to Alan and in true Alan fashion, a meeting was called for a form of counsel. And it was ordered by all who attended that Mary should be killed for what she had done. The killing was to be carried out by a man named Lee Furrow. He was to be the hitman. Furrow was scared that if he did not see this task through, he would be killed himself by Alan. So when the attempt at poisoning Mary didn't work, he proceeded to strangle her. Her body was later dumped in the nearby Fryant Kern Canal. To this day, Mary Sue Kitt's body has not been found. Alan was arrested for the robbery and the murder of Mary. This was quite a landmark case as he was one of the very few people who were charged with murder without the body of the victim and he was sentenced to time in Folsom Prison. But instead of thinking about the crime he had committed and thinking how he could repent for his actions, he got close to his cellmate, Billy Ray Hamilton. They both sat for hours in their cell 
talking about how they could take out the witnesses in the case against Alan. While he was being held in prison, he was at the centre of an incredibly awful attack on another inmate. That inmate was lashed with gallons of boiling hot water, had razor blades thrown at him and beaten badly once he was tied to the bars of his cell. This was known as a death penalty and was ordered by Alan himself. It was unknown what the cellmate did to deserve this sort of punishment. Billy was released from prison and as promised and by the order of Alan, he went to carry out the murders of those who were witnesses against him in the case of the Fresno robbery. Billy walks into the market and opened fire with his sawn off shotgun on the three workers, Byron, Douglas and Josephine. All three of them died. While the shots were being fired, a neighbour and another worker came in to where the action was and where the gunshots rang out. Rios, the worker, had come to help and was hit in the arm as he raised it to protect himself. Luckily he did this, as this was the reason he survived this brutal attack. And Abbott, who was also hurt, opened fire on Billy with his own gun to defend himself and anyone else in the market. Billy was hurt, but not killed, and he managed to flee with his girlfriend. Not long after this event, Billy was arrested and found to be in possession of a list of names and addresses, one of which was named on that list that he killed just earlier. That was Byron. He was the one that Keyes had been taken from at the time he swam at Allen's ranch and he testified to that fact. Lee Furrow, the killer of Mary Sue Kitts, had already been arrested for this and was serving life for her murder, even though her body had still not been found. And another case had come to light after a testimony from Lee's girlfriend at the time in 1983 that a family of three from the Chino Hills area were murdered. That a local man by the name of Kevin Cooper was serving multiple life sentences for these murders. Lee's girlfriend told the police that on the day in question, he had come home to her with his overalls covered in what looked like blood, which he changed out of and disposed of. It has been said that these killings were on the order of Alan due to a disagreement over horses that Alan enjoyed buying. It was said that Kevin Cooper was being set up and was the fall guy for the murders and that in fact it was Alan's regular hitman, Lee Furrow, who had killed them. Police took this information seriously and began looking into DNA testing to prove this. It was all unravelling for Alan now. While he was still in prison for his earlier crimes, more charges were being drawn against him. A trial had been set for Alan to face murder charges for the three people, one of whom he had ordered to kill in the market, and the fact that the other names on the list were also to be murdered. So eight counts of conspiracy to murder witnesses were added to his charge sheet. Along with many counts of violent robberies, which he and his gang had committed over time. He was no stranger to a trial, as he had already been sentenced for the murder of Mary Sue Kitts previously. During this trial, a huge 58 witnesses came forward to testify against Alan. The trial took 23 days to complete, and the jury unanimously decided that Alan should be sentenced to the death penalty due to the special circumstances with the murders. He was sent to the San Quentin State Prison to await his execution. Many appeals were launched to save Alan. In 2005, the Court of Appeals stated that the trial was inadequate and due to the fact that the state solely relied on people trying to get off on their own sentences and had made deals to testify in exchange for lesser sentences or even their freedom. This was argued to be biased. The court denied this and the judge went on to state that the evidence of guilt was overwhelming against Alan and he should pay for his awful actions. 
Although he wasn't the person to pull the trigger himself, he was in fact there in the mind of those who did pull the trigger for him. In 2006, newly appointed governor Arnold Schwarzenegger refused a clemency for Allen. His statement read, his conduct did not result from youth or inexperience, but instead resulted from the hardened and calculating decisions of a mature man. This was after he had read a poem released by Allen, making fun of his victims and indeed glorifying his actions of murder and violence. Alan went on to tell prison guards that he was in fact blind and deaf and also severely disabled and needed a wheelchair to move around prison. These were not substantiated by a doctor and they felt this was aroused to get out of his pending death penalty. Eventually, the time had come for Alan to face the death penalty and on January the 17th, 2006, only one day after his 76th birthday, he was led to a room where he himself walked to with no need of a wheelchair or walking aid. He sat down and directly looked at his family who were there to support him. He entered the chamber as a native Indian with a feather on his chest, a leather pouch and a beaded headband. His last words were read out after his execution had taken place. They were, Hokey hey, it's a good day to die. Thank you very much. I love you all. Goodbye. And at 12.38am, Clarence Ray Allen was pronounced dead. It is yet to be confirmed if Allen was in fact responsible for the deaths of the Chino Hills family. The question is, why does a man that has it all 